transitioning from Cosmatic.com, which is a React website, uh, and actually building a React native mobile app. Uh, and part of that was trying to share as much code as possible between those two, uh, not having to maintain two separate pieces of business logic and everything like that. Um, and so I'm actually like right in the middle of it right now. So I may not have all the answers, but I can tell you what I've learned so far. And you guys are welcome to ask me anything about React itself, React Native, Cosmatic, anything at all. Uh, just feel free to, if you have a question, just say it. I, you don't need to raise your hand or anything. Uh, we'll just go through it. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chris. I will make America great again. Um, <laughs> I spend my days and nights working on Cosmatic. Uh, I originally started as a mechanical engineer uh, in college and then transitioned to a Python developer, entrepreneur, and now I'm a JavaScript enthusiast, and now I'm trying to be a mobile developer. So uh, we use a lot of that at Cosmatic. We're Python back end, uh, JavaScript front end, um, and so we're going to transition that with our mobile app. So what is React? Uh, it is a series of modules for building interfaces. Uh, so when you think about like what MVC is, it is just the V. It is not a full framework. It is just a library for building interfaces. Um, it's very fast on the web, uh, and it's much faster than any other JavaScript-based mobile, because uh, it actually uses native views. Um, and it's actually very popular right now. It's just been getting a lot of popularity the last you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of people you know, make big jumps. It's written by Facebook. Uh, they're supporting it right now. They're using it in their own mobile apps. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, one of the reasons people don't like it is it actually ships with its own syntax, which is called JSX. Um, and it can be very confusing. Um, but basically, that little code block there is what most of you will see in the React components look like. So we actually have some regular HTML with that nav tag, uh, but then the link and logo are basically components that you would have written in React. And you pass them different attributes, um, which are called props in React. So you'll see a lot of this style of code uh, when we talk about React and when you get into it. It's actually technically optional, uh, but when you're following different tutorials and different things like that, you're going to see that type of code everywhere. Uh, so when I say React is a series of modules, it's actually used to be one big module, uh, but it'll split into three major components. So now you have the React base, which has kind of like the overarching like architecture, uh, kind of the, the theories of React built into that. Uh, then you have React DOM, which is how you build different websites. So that's how you build your divs and you sync up your divs with data and everything like that. Uh, and then most recently they launched React Native, uh, which at first was just iOS, but now is iOS and Android. Um, and has, allows you to write once and actually have the different views. Uh, the community has actually added more fun things recently, like React Canvas allows you to contain React to an HTML5 canvas. So if you want to make games or some sort of interactive, like 3D JS kind of thing. Um, and then you have GL React Native, which uses OpenGL on different apps. So you can use that potentially for games, but other just like more visualization stuff and different data bindings there. Um, but they, all the code looks the same. It all uses JSX. Uh, and it basically just depends on where it's going to render to. Um, so I'll touch on this, and then we can all go and eat. Um, passing data around in React um, with just by itself can actually get it's pretty straightforward up front, but as you build an entire web app, like we did with Cosmatic, you start having components which have components which have components which have components. And you need to make sure all that data is in sync. So if you have a select question, uh, you want to basically make sure that once you make that selection, that value gets passed up to your app so that it can make the API call or it can do something else. You know. But the select question by itself isn't going to be any more complicated than this, where we have our different props here. Um, basically, a function that's going to happen when you change what your default value is, and then the choices that should be in your select question. Uh, and then as we render that, we render the select HTML tag, and we pass in those different props, the default value and the change. Uh, and then we, this is basically just loops through the choices that we passed in to the select question, and for each of those returns an option. So we're just generating HTML here uh, that will create this nice little component 
that when you select something, it will report back to its parent what you selected. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Uh, but what happens is as you start building more complex systems, you have something that it takes in props and it passes on those props and that one passes on its props. So in this case we had, and this is from our old uh, Cosmac.com, was we had an address select uh, which took in the city so we could geo-suggest based on what city you're in, uh, what the placeholder text should be, and what should happen when you actually select. Uh, and so we use that, but we end up passing that to a geo-suggest, and it passed in basically all the same props. Then the geo-suggest had two other subcomponents that were talking to Google Maps and displaying that drop-down so you could actually select the address, and it ended up becoming or every single one of those had to report all the way back up the chain. And so anytime you change a component, you had to make sure everything down the line and back up worked in sync. Uh, and that kind of went against the spirit of React, which is every component, when you write a React component, it should be pretty self-contained. It should be, you should be able to look at this code for this select question and understand exactly what's happening. Uh, Cause it's telling, all it's doing is outputting HTML, which is pretty simple. And it's doing some really basic things, uh, but then, once you actually get to a point where you're passing properties down and up the chain, you can't rely on a single component or looking at a single component to tell you the whole story. Um, and so what that kind of created this new thing for Facebook that they launched their first iteration of this um, and that the community has kind of taken on as their own, uh, which is called Flux. And I'm going to leave this up here while we eat pizza and see if anyone can understand it. So <laughs> let's go grab some food. So this is Flux, and this is actually how Facebook uh, decided to get people excited about Flux, was this diagram here. Um, and I can tell you, we actually wrote our first version of Cosmatic.com with React without using Flux because this looked terrible, and I didn't even want to touch it. Um, but what ended up happening was kind of what I talked about on this last slide, which is we had these components which passed data to different components, which pass data to different components, and it just came this like rushing nesting doll of components, uh, and it was a terrible to maintain. So uh, around June of last year, I actually started to dive into Flux and actually understand, A, trying to understand what this meant, but B, looking at what the community did, uh, because Flux is kind of more of an ideal, or an idea, than it is, it's also a library, but uh, people wrote libraries on top of that to actually uh, hide the complexity. Um, so that's terrible, but when we actually look at the code of how you actually do these things, it's really not so bad. Uh, so with Flux, you have two different types of classes that you create, uh, action classes and stores. Um, and actions are, in the most simplest, they just create different functions that your code can call from inside a component. Uh, so show the phone. So this is a footer. We have a footer on Cosmatic.com. Sometimes you want to show the phone number in that footer. Sometimes we don't. Uh, so we have two actions, show the phone and hide the phone. And so that's, you know, seven lines or six lines, really simple. Uh, in our store here, we have basically a constructor which says we're going to default to show the phone to false. And we're going to bind the store to the footer actions. So that says when someone calls uh, show phone, we want this store to respond to it. Now we can bind other actions into this store. So let's say anytime someone logs out, we're going to show the phone again, which really wouldn't make sense. But if you wanted to do that, you can bind across different actions and stores. But so here we just simple example, when you call show phone, we're going to set the show phone state to true right here. And then when you call hide phone, we're going to set it back to false. So that's really simple. And then on the React side, this is for uh, the web, we have our landing page here, uh, which imports the footer actions and calls show phone when it mounts, which is basically to say on load. Uh, and then our footer component down here, while long and verbose uh, to the bane of John Back, uh, basically says when I start, I want to get my state from the footer store. When I load, I want to start listening for the footer store's changes. And when I unload, I want to unlisten. When those changes come in, we're going to set our state to be the new state of the footer store. 
And then when we render, we're basically going to say, if there's a phone, set the phone number. Otherwise, leave it blank and return a footer. So what this does is allows you, even though the landing page needed to change something on the footer, the landing page itself didn't, doesn't actually call footer at any time. The landing page is, you know, there's header, then whatever the current page is in the footer. Uh, in our old app, we would have to have the landing page go up the chain to the top app, call hide phone, and that would cycle that all the way down to the footer. So we had this one giant component that was thousands of lines long that just handled all these different edge cases of subcomponents running to change other subcomponents. Uh, but in this case, we can have any component ever that wants to affect the footer call show phone or hide phone and actually make that happen. Uh, so reality flux, despite this terrible diagram, really just means your components actually uh, listen to a store and then anything, whether it's your component itself or your web API, can actually call actions that actually affect that store. Um, and so this code here uses something called alt, uh, which is basically uh, a version of Flux that works on both uh, web, um, on the server itself, and on mobile. Uh, and so that, using that, we actually allowed us to take this same code and actually apply it to mobile, which we'll talk about here. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of things we actually did with the Cosmetic mobile app, which, again, I'm in the middle of building right now, but the data layer is coming uh, very fast because of this. Um, there's a couple things that you probably should know um, that I want to just touch on that you should look up after this if you're interested in doing React. Um, so the first one is React Router. Uh, basically, if you're going to create anything in React that's more than a single page, you're going to need to be able to navigate from one page to another, so the landing page or the login page. Um, React Router allows you to do that all within the same app, so you don't need to reload pages or anything like that. Uh, React Router uses something called history. Uh, this is going to be important because it allows you to move pages or move, change the location history of your app um, from within your Flux stores. So. Uh, the, the example I'm going to talk about is basically we want anytime anyone logs into the site to move to our results page and show them their latest cosmetic results. Um, and so the best way to do that is use this history library which says on login go to the results page. Um, React Native Router Flux is basically React Router for React Native. Um, it's both Android and iOS friendly which is super important for us. Um, Alt.js I kind of touched on before, which is how we use Flux. Um, there's a new one out there called Redux, um, and there'll probably be a new one uh, next month too, but a lot of people really like Redux. We haven't, I haven't had the chance to dive into it, but a lot of these same philosophies will apply. Um, and then there's SuperAgent, and so that's actually what we use to make Ajax calls inside Cosmatic. Um, it works in Node, it works in the browser, and pretty recently it now starts working on native, uh, which literally allows us to copy and paste code over uh, when we set things up right. So, like I said, we're going to kind of touch on this uh, example here. So after someone logs in to Cosmatic, we want to move them to the results page. Um, and so here's our action. Um, so here we're importing our super agent Ajax call. Uh, we're creating two actions here called login success and login fail. Uh, basically, those are the ones that all of our, our login page is going to listen to. Um, so if it login fails, there's going to be an error message. We want to display that error message. If it su succeeds, we, other things are going to start happening in the app. Um, and this is our real basic, this is a real and working uh, Ajax request um, that basically calls in to slash login sends the email and password that we passed in, login fail uh, if it errors out, and then login success, and we pass in the token that our auth server returns. Um, and so the, what will happen here um, is our store, scroll down here a bit, um, on login success, the first thing we want to do is set our cookie, um, which I wasn't really worth copying and pasting all that code here, uh, but that'll keep you logged in for the length of the cookie. Uh, and then here what we'll do is we'll call history.push to push us to the results page. 
then we set our token in the store and on login fail, we don't actually do anything here, but really simple. You make the Ajax request, it passes back that it succeeded and you store that in your authentication store. Um, and then so our actual login page here, um, I touch on a few things kind of React specific here. Um, first one being, here's how you kind of manage your text inputs or your fields uh, on a React site. So basically you want to pass in an on change event. Um, so this is basically just a glorified input uh, of the type email, uh, has an email address label. And then once it, anytime you type, it will actually call handle email change where all we're doing in this example is setting that state email to be whatever you're typing in. Um, same thing with the password. And then what happens here is when you click on this link, this A tag, we're gonna call this underscore login, which what it's doing here is calling authentication actions dot login. So that's using the email and password that we typed in and it's actually going to call login. And so if we want, we can go over here to Cosmatic. Uh, and so as I'm typing, it's saving that into the state, um, which I guess I'm not even on the Wi-Fi, so this won't work. But <laughs> uh, what happens is we will, um, yeah, I'm not gonna make it. it. When it happens, it will actually push us to the slash results the second that worked. Um, you can see here though that we have this error message that login failed because I'm not online. Um, and that's the same thing. That's what happened when uh, on login fail, we actually set an error message and then the login page responds to that. So basically everything that happens is, what we want to happen is when you log in, it makes a request, comes down and sets, um, does this history.push to result to make that happen. Uh, so that's keeping all of our business logic or the UX logic inside of these stores and actions so that we don't have to like recreate that every time we update the login page. Um, so the same thing on mobile. And so this is what I've been doing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically the way the React Flux works is you can only dispatch so many things at a time. So since we are, are re reacting to the login success event, uh, we can't send out additional events in the middle of that. Um, so basically you just set a timeout and which basically pushes it on a separate thread. Um, it's not necessary on mobile to do these sort of things, but on a lot of the web stuff, since we're doing it in the browser, it kind of cares about that sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, there's actually a, a separate w a library out there that will automatically defer all those things for us, um, but this is kind of the, the simplest way. Um, there's a few other things that you know you can't basically you can't have actions call other actions in the same thread, so you have to just set a timeout. Um, usually, it's kind of an anti-pattern. You don't normally want to do it, but when it when it comes to like actually doing uh, redirects and things like that, it's worth it. So. So uh, last week I wanted to basically implement our login on mobile. Um, and so to create the login action, I was actually able to copy the entire same action from the last one, no code changed. Um, because we were using super agent to do the Ajax request and because we're using alt to handle our flux, the no code actually changed. Um, and so then we actually wanted to do this kind of same idea on login, send you to the results page. Um, and this store look, should look really familiar. Um, basically same thing on login success. We want to save it to core data so that we can use that later. Uh, we want to send us to the results page and we call actions.results, um, which basically in React Native Router, that's how you move around is you call this actions dot whatever the name of the page is. Um, so interestingly, I, did, I wanted to run a diff on that to actually see what actually changed um, so we changed our import history uh, and replaced it with React Native Router. Uh, instead of saving a cookie, we saved it to core data. And instead of doing that set timeout history push, we call action that results. Um, and so while I haven't done it yet, clearly I can write a few wrapper functions. And now these same files will work on both web and mobile, uh, which is super important for us because 
uh, main, you know, maintainability is going to be huge going forward. Uh, we're a smaller team, so maintaining an Android, iOS, and mobile app, um, or a web app, are going to be super hard to do if we're trying to fight bugs on both, uh, both systems at once. Um, even in this example here with this login call, we actually had a bug where on certain, um, certain browsers, it wouldn't respect this content type, so it was not returning JSON. Um, and so we actually have to add this special flag called format JSON um, in our server so that it would return JSON always no matter what. Um, and so having to like fight that bug in a browser and then have that same bug pop up on mobile uh, would be really frustrating and that's just for a login. So as we move forward and we get into our more advanced components with displaying our different properties and the sorting of those properties, it's gonna be really helpful to not have to write that code twice. Um, so in this instance, um, uh, this is what the mobile component looks like. Uh, basically, we have, uh, we're importing the authentication actions, we're importing a button, um, and then we're basically calling authentication to actions at login. Uh, same thing, you pass in this, the email, pass in the password, it'll log you in and it'll redirect us to the results page. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing the last few weeks with transitioning is basically writing that code, making sure that code is in a way that we can reuse it on both uh, and making small changes where I need to, like uh, you know, how we redirect or how we save user data on the device. Um, but React Native is like way more than just like sharing code with your web app. Um, it's a lot of, you know, it's one of the only things that you can use JavaScript to write native standard components um, with one line of code, you can actually use like the UI tab bar on iOS or the drawer on Android. Um, the JavaScript runs not on the main thread like you will with other JavaScript mobile apps. So the UI will actually feel snappy. Um, it's not necessarily as fast as a pure native app uh, because it has to talk between the UI and the JavaScript all the time. Um, but that's just basically like after you make an API call, it might be a little slower to update the UI, but you like when you scroll, it'll still just be just as fast. Um, and they keep a, like a really close eye on like what your frames per second look like on mobile, so that actually feels as native as possible. Um, one of the big things for us is I'm not a mobile developer, um, never done it before, um, been around it a long time, but. I know CSS really well. So with React Native, you can actually style with Flexbox, uh, which is just a new version of basically new subset of um, styles in CSS. Um, compared to like iOS, you have auto layout, which I've never heard anyone talk positively about before. Um, and you know, just trying to get that to work with on the different phone sizes and you know iPads and different orientations. Um, so it's super important for us to make sure that we're leveraging the skills that we have um, and actually be able to build this out and use a lot of the same code because we actually use Flexbox on Cosmac.com. So can't prove it, but I'm hoping a lot of the code will transition over. Um, so you also get the power of the Node ecosystem and all the libraries. So um, kind of what I talked about with, you know, being able to use Alt.js, being able to use uh, React Router, but being able to use Super Agent and just take advantage of all these different uh, Node libraries, being able to run them inside your uh, mobile app. Um, and then of course at the end, you can still run native code. So if you have libraries out there that need to access the GPS or access the camera and things like that, uh, those can still run, or you can write them yourself. Um, but you can write to basically a wrapper that creates a React component based on that. So you kind of get the best of both worlds for the really simple views. Uh, you can use React, um, and luckily for us, our mobile app should be pretty much all of that. Uh, but for things like managing push notifications and uh, if we ever need to access a camera or GPS, we can leverage native code for that. And yeah, that's basically what I want to talk to you guys about and how to share that code. Um, any questions about React, Flux, Alt, React Native, Cosmatic, anything like that, I'd be happy to talk about. It says you're two cats, but don't you also want a turtle? And a bunny. Okay. Yeah. Is, is that the question? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, has anyone else been working with React? You can show hands. One, two. 
Two? Okay. <laughs> and then uh, both, oh, three. Have you guys ever worked with React Native? No? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on it, Matt? Um, I, think, I think it was a really easy transition from doing React on the web to doing React Native. Um, I haven't gotten to do any Android work yet, so we'll see. I think the app I'm working on uses a lot of um, community developed um, components for like playing audio and that kind of stuff. So I think I'll have some challenges there because a lot of the community components were written before uh, React Android came out. So a lot of the, the libraries that people are using haven't added Android support yet. So I think in the next year that that'll be really solid. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, tr I've always wanted to do native development, but I've never really been able to have time to pick up Objective-C mm -hmm. or Swift. So I think, you know, we do a lot of JavaScript where I work and React, and so it was really easy to just to jump in and do it React Native. So it's been positive. Yeah, I mean, when you start React uh, Native and you run, basically, they have a little CLI, you run React Native in it, it basically generates the Xcode file, it generates the Android file, and generates all the JavaScript files. You can hit play. Uh, and as you're developing, you can actually um, do, I'll see if I can actually run it. Um, but as you're running, you can, I'll pull up WebStorm, we can make some changes here. Um, we got a few minutes. Um, it, it reloads live, you don't need to recompile. Um, so if we look at, close all these. Um, our landing page here. Um, I don't know how to make this bigger. There we go. Um, here's basically everything that's. Oh, this is a loading page. Wrong one. Launch. There we go. So here's how we have like this little loading page right here. Um, and so if I wanted to make changes, even just like simple text changes, you know, um, save that, reload and then makes that change. Like that is like 100% different than your typical, you know, Xcode development where you're making these changes, recompiling, pushing out to the device. Um, basically, it's what it's doing is it's running a separate um, JavaScript node library that it's connecting to. Um, and you have everything available to you from, um, you can debug in Chrome, you can have it automatically reload. Um, you can show performance monitor. So when I talk about they want to try and keep it as fast as possible, they're maintaining that 60 frames per second there, um, showing you how much memory it's using. Um, and so when you hit, the, you know, then it's still again very native. So you can pop things up. You can hit, you know, login, which won't work because we're not on the internet. But um, and again, it does the same thing as Cosmac.com. When we log in, it'll transition to the results page and show us all the results because um, I just transitioned all of our property code over. Um, so again, we're searching properties. Um, and here, the big thing here is um, basically what happens is it automatically will search properties when you log in. And so um, that's the kind of things that we use uh, you know, React and Flux for is to maintain that logic of when you log out, we want to clear all these properties. When we log in, we want to do that. So. Yeah. If you want to get on the Wi-Fi, yeah. it's just unicorn dash office. For just gaslight? Yeah, just gaslight. And, and soon they're going to add the hot reloading to React Native. Mm -hmm. So you won't even have to hit refresh. Yeah. It'll just re-render the UI with whatever state you have, which will be awesome. You know, the, the reload is cool, but you lose where you were in the app. Mm -hmm. And if you're working on a screen that's like five or six deep, that's a pain. You have to keep going cool. back. So we'll see how this works. We'll hit log in. <laughs> right. Um, and so, so you can see basically there, it had zero properties returned. When the call actually finished, we got these seven properties down. Um, and so if we actually look at, um, Cosmatic here, and we re-log in, um, it will actually follow the same path, um, unless I type my password wrong. Maybe. Let's just restart. So, 
So again, that all happened in the Flux side. No, nothing about the login page knew that it was going to take you to the results page. Uh, that all happened in that business logic, which we then transitioned over to our, our native app. Um, and so my next few weeks at work basically looked like transitioning every one of these components. You know, right now, here's how our properties look. Um, and of course, here how they, uh, is how they look on mobile. Um, and so basically recreating this as a native view um, in, you know, as opposed to this. Um, so, you know, basically though, I mean, again, I have this CSS right here um, that I can use. And right now in our web, we're using Flexbox. So it should be really, really similar. Um, and it's why I'm having the very, you know, confidence to say we're gonna have a React mobile app out there uh, by the summer. So maybe sooner if I don't screw anything up, so, yeah. So when it comes to actually sharing your business logic mm -hmm. between the two, are you just going to do that by NPM packages? Or? So I'll probably use a git submodule. Okay. Um, and that way, if I ever need to branch that submodule for small changes, like if we're going to, you know, since I can launch mo uh, web a lot quicker than mobile, well, actually, that may not be true. But regardless, I might be able to branch off of that, still sh share the same code base, but I might have small changes on one that eventually get merged back in the master. Uh, so we can do bug fix releases on that. Um, actually, one thing that I've not played with, and Matt, you might have, is you can actually push hot updates to your app without resubmitting. And so uh, at first it was kind of like this weird gray area, but Apple came out and said, no, it's cool, we're fine with this. As long as it doesn't fundamentally change what your app does, you can push updates outside of the App Store ecosystem. So one of the biggest like, plagues of the iOS app development it is you push something, it has a bug, it's released. Uh, you find this critical bug, your only options are leave it in the store for seven days with the bug or pull it off the store. You can't revert back, you can't push a f update any quicker than that. So um, this is, allows you to basically publish new code online, your app checks where it downloads it and reuses it, so. Microsoft actually just came out with a service called Code Push mm -hmm. for free that lets you do that. For, for React for Native. For React Native and Cordova. Oh, cool. Nice. Awesome. Is there, is there a way to do that with React Native other than code push? No, yeah. Thing? Yep. So. Yeah, there's a few libraries out there that'll do it. I think code push just like gives you a nice server to do it with. But yeah, I think if you're running your own server, you just keep the uh, basically the manifest up there that tells you React Native what to look for. So. Yeah, there's, some, there's a guy in our company using code push to do that for React Native. Um, that's the only way I've seen it done. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's some open source libraries. I just read a manifest file and download any updates. So, that's cool. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>